Beloved brothers and sisters, as we had said, in the sixth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ saw a dream. In his dream, he saw that he was entering Makkah al Mukarramah and the Haram area with his companions and they were safe and secure and some of them had shaved heads and some of them their hair was very short. So this was an instruction automatically from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the dreams of the messengers are revelation. So he got up and he told his companions, I intend to fulfill Umrah. It was not going to be possible unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written it. And so what happened is his people were quite surprised, but they knew that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he instructed, then it was to be obeyed. So he started off by calling the Arab, the Arab, the Bedouin Arabs from the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. And as he called them, he said, let us go to Mecca. There is a war between us and Quraysh. They want to attack us. They want to harm us at the same time. There is no peace between us. There are so many skirmishes that took place between the battle of Khandaq, the battle known as the Alliance or the Trench. And, and, and at that particular time, the following year, many skirmishes took place. Lots of different platoons were sent and much loss was suffered by the Mushriks. So how was this going to be possible? The Prophet ﷺ said, look, the Haram has been made safe. These people may decide to abuse that or to disrespect the sanctity of the haram and they may even if they do decide that we are going to go without arms without weapons and we want to go in large numbers but sadly the bedouin arabs some of them they did not respond to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they felt in their hearts that if we were to all go to mecca we're not going to come back and they felt in their hearts that if, if these people are going to go they too are not going to come back so they made an excuse to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they delayed. In the meantime, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not delay the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's listen very carefully because this, as much as it may seem something that was not achieved by the Muslims ultimately, but if you look at what happened thereafter, this was the beginning of the victory of the Muslims. This dream was the beginning of the victory of the Muslims. So, the Ansar and the Muhajirin got together between 1,400 and 1,500 men. They got together and they decided we are going with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they began on their path to Makkah al Mukarramah. They had taken with them the sacrificial animals. At that time, the Umrah was slightly different from what we have it today, very slightly in some of its detailed regulations. And Hajj was not yet compulsory. So what had happened is the people had left al Madinah al munawwara and they had had their ihram and at the same time they had taken their sacrificial animals and they had progressed. Now sacrificial animals from the pagan days, they had high value in the eyes of the people. If anyone saw a sacrificial animal, it normally had a sign. They would put a sign on it. This is not to eat and so on. This is for a sacrifice in the haram. People would not really steal that because it was considered highly taboo and it would bring about very, very bad luck on the person. In fact, the wrath of the Almighty. So they had progressed and as they proceeded, Quraysh knew exactly what these people had intended. They knew very well that the Muslims are coming 1,400 to 1,500 men and they are unarmed. They only have a few swords in order to protect themselves from some perhaps attack on the road and so on. But they do not intend to harm. They want to come into Mecca. They want to make Umrah and they want to go back to al Madinah and Munawwara without any violence, nothing besides an act of worship for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what had happened? As they had gone, when they got to a place known as Usfan, when they got to a place known as Usfan between Medina and Mecca, the messenger had come back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa whom Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had sent to find out what was happening in Quraysh. What are their views? So when this messenger got back, he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Quraysh has decided they are not allowing you. They're going to block you. They're going to stop you. No matter what. Because they feel it is against 
their pride and dignity to allow the enemy to come into the city even if it means to engage in an act of worship. And yet Quraysh in the past used to allow their enemies to come to Makkah because they had certain months in which they would not fight. Just to allow for those who, were, who wanted to fulfill their Umrah and their Hajj to come in. Obviously at that time they used to worship idols and so on. The Muslims had intended not for the sake of idols but for the pleasure of Allah, the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Quraysh, this man says, they have sent Khalid ibn al-Walid with an army of men, approximately 100, 200 men. There was a number of men that had left with Khalid ibn al-Walid. Some narrations make mention of 200 men. They were heavily armed and they were coming to charge at the Muslims. Now this is something very bad because the Muslims did not intend any harm. They wanted to go engage in an act of worship and return. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard that Khalid ibn al-Walid has left with, at that time he was amongst the mushriks, he had left with this little group of people in order to attack, the Prophet ﷺ changed his path. And he decided to arrive in Makkah from, not from the normal path, but via a place known as Hudaybiyah. It was called Hudaybiyah because there was a well there known as Hudaybiyah. So people might ask, why is it called Hudaybiyah? Because of the well. So when the Prophet ﷺ got to this place known as Hudaybiyah, he camped there. And when he camped there, the kuffar of Makkah were very uneasy because here you have Khalid ibn al-Walid returning to Makkah, telling the people of Makkah that really I did not even meet these people on the path. They were too sharp and they had used a different road. They had used a different route. You know, later on, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he says, whenever I fought the Muslims, and whenever I engaged in anything against the Muslims, I knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a protected man. The man completely protected. It's impossible for me to harm him or attack him. This is a warrior of war telling you later on that this is the messenger and his status. As Allah says, Allah is the one who protects Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, when the path was changed, Khalid ibn al-Walid came back. When he came back, they had camped, the Muslims had camped in Hudaybiyah. The, the kuffar of Quraysh decided to send them a man, officially, to say, do you know what? Go and find out officially, why are these people here? They knew, but they wanted it official. So they sent Budayl ibn Warqa al-Khuza'i, one of the leaders of Khuza'a. This was also the plan of Allah. The plan of Allah. Why? They sent a man who was one of the leaders of Khuza'a. Later on, this man realized who was right and who was wrong. And you will see what happened to Khuza'a. So this Budayl ibn Warqa al-Khuza'i, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and says, I am a messenger from Quraysh in an official capacity. I want to know why are you here? Now he's watching the Muslims. He's seeing them in ihram. He's seeing them with talbiya. Talbiya means labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. We are at your service. We have responded to your call, O oh Allah. It was a call of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ was instructed in his dream. And so they were responding to the call of Allah. Labbaik wa sa'daik. Labbaik means we are at your service, O oh Allah. We have responded to your call, O oh Allah. Allah calls and we respond. So he heard this. He was touched by it. And he was told, we are only here in order to engage in Umrah and we will go back. That's it, we don't want anything extra and we will not accept anything less. So Budayl, he understood it. He went to Quraysh and told them, these people, they don't have weaponry. These people are not intending harm. They are calm, they are relaxed. They have come with their leader in large numbers, 1,000 odd, meaning 1,400 to 500. And they do not intend harm. Perhaps we should just let them in. Quraysh said, you don't know, just sit down. You don't know anything. We, we are going to send someone else. We are going to send someone else. This was also a plan of Allah. So the next person they sent was Al-Hulays ibn Al-Qama. He was from Al-Ahabish. These are the people who were made up of different groups around Makkah al-Mukarramah who did not perhaps belong to one particular clan. They were known as Ahbash because they were the ones who fell under a specific leader and they had pledged allegiance with the people of Quraysh and they were together with them. And what had happened is, when the Prophet ﷺ sent Al-Hulays, he was from the people who really looked 
at the animals of sacrifice very highly. They were scared of animals of sacrifice because they knew these are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though they were mushriks, they knew we're not supposed to harm these. So when he was coming, the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, bring forth all your animals and let him see all of these animals and say your talbiya aloud, aloud. So, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, aloud they are uttering. And the animals are there and this Al-Hulais comes through and he looks at the Prophet ﷺ and he sees all this, he asks them the same question. He is responded with a similar answer. He goes back to Quraysh. He says, look, these people have their animals. Perhaps you should allow them. They, they are not harmful. They are not going to harm anyone. They want to come just to engage in worship. You people are custodians of this place. Quraysh was custodian of Zamzam. They were in charge in, in, in Mecca of even the Kaaba at that particular time. So how could they say we're not allowing somebody to come here? So now what happened is Quraysh then decided, no, 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 no. This is wrong. You cannot do this and we are not going to accept what you are saying. How can you come and tell us? We only told you to find out. Now you're coming to instruct us what is it that needs to be done and so on. And therefore, after a while, what happened? They sent another man, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. This was also a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the leaders of Thaqif. Thaqif were the people of Ta'if. Remember what they did to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this man, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, he went... And he spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He saw the people. He saw everything. He saw the talbiyah. He saw the animals. He also came back. Do you know what he said? He said, oh Quraysh. Now this was a leader of Thaqif. He was a senior politician. He says, oh Thaqif, I have been to Kisra. And I have been to Kisra in Persia and Qaisar of the Roman Empire. And I have seen how their people operate with them. How they treat each other. This man, there is a totally different relation between him and those who follow him. They would give their lives for him. And this man, he has disciplined them to the degree that they look down when they are talking. And they don't speak loudly. They have so much respect. They are the most well-cultured people. Anyone who adopts Islam properly becomes a person whose morals are of the highest standards. That's because that's Islam, subhanallah. So Quraysh was shocked. They heard this. Obviously, they knew it. They did not like it. They rejected the statement. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to happen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted these leaders who had come, who were not directly the leaders of Quraysh, but people whom Quraysh used in order to go to speak to the Muslims. Allah wanted them to see who was right and who was wrong. Quraysh just denied it. I want to pause for a moment. I studied in Medina Munawwara. And I tell you, we had a ruling and it's still there. But you know, you're not allowed to make Hajj unless five years have lapsed. This was for a long time for those who live there. And you need a special permit. I'm mentioning this because it's connected to what I said just now. And so we as students used to like to go for Hajj. And we sometimes, you know, you have a pass and five, for five years you don't get a pass thereafter. So some of the students who are adamant on going, they say, look, the last day, Let's just all go. What we do, the whole busload will not have any permit. We'll all be in ihram. And as we're passing the checkpoint, all these people are Muslims. We will loudly just say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. And continue saying that. Let's see what happens. Believe me, 100% of the time it worked. Allahu Akbar. They look at you. They don't ask you for anything. They just let you carry on. Why? Because, hey, how are they going to stop someone who's already in ihram? And screaming, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. And not just one, a whole army of them. Subhanallah. May Allah open our doors. So this is the softening of the heart by the talbiyah. And the softening of the heart by looking at people in ihram. And imagine, at the moment, it, things are different. But here we're giving you the example. Even the ahbash of the time, they also had that in them. That if they see the animals, they wouldn't stop anyone. Quraysh stopped them. Quraysh said, no, you're not going. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us goodness. Thereafter, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided that, no, I need to send someone to talk to them. So he appointed Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And he said, Uthman ibn Affan will go, he will speak to them upon the guarantee of a man known as Aban ibn Sa'id al-Amawi. This was a man who had given a guarantee of the safety of Uthman. At that time, we've already explained how this guarantee worked. 
So Uthman ibn Affan, 10 people joined him. They were from amongst those who some of them wanted to meet their relatives and some of them wanted to go and see this one and that one. The Prophet ﷺ instructed Uthman to do two things. One was to go to Quraysh and inform them why we are here. Secondly, to go to the weak Muslims who were stopped from making hijrah and tell them, Abishiru, good news for you. Inshallah, very soon there will be victory. Based on what? The dream that Muhammad ﷺ had. So just bear a bit of patience. It's not so long now, inshallah, we will be victorious. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu and the others, they had gone through into Makkah al-Mukarramah and they met Quraysh. He met Quraysh and he spoke to the leaders and he told them, this is why we are here. They told him, you are never ever going to enter this place whilst we are here in this particular manner. No ways. You will not enter this arm, meaning this place. You can tell the group of people to leave and you can all go away. We have no discussion. We don't want to entertain anything. In the meantime, they hatched a plan. What did they do? They sent a man known as Mikras ibn Hafs with about 50 to 70 men, depending on some of the narrations. And he had gone back knowing these people are unarmed and he had intended to harm them. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had had a man known as Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu who was guarding the group. And when he saw this man, Mikras, coming through, trying to attack, they had surrounded them and brought them captive. Besides Mikras, he fled. But the others were held captive for a while. In the meantime, in Makkah al-Mukarramah, the leaders of Quraysh told Uthman ibn Affan, you can do your own tawaf here and then you can go back. As for the others, nobody is coming here. He said, how can I make tawaf here when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being blocked? I'm going to go back. So they stopped him. Even from going back, they held him for a while. When they held him for a while, news got to the Muslims who were not very far. They were in Hudaybiyah, which is just outside Makkah. News got to them that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu has been murdered by Quraysh. This was a rumor. However, it was a rumor that had its effects. What happened, subhanallah, when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he was deeply saddened. And at the same time, he was now preparing his people to go and revenge and retaliate the death of one of his men. This was always the case. If you look at the battles that took place, a lot of the battles had taken place because of one person being executed or one person being harmed and so on. Look at what happened to Banu Qaynuqa. We spoke about them. If you take a look at the chief of Ghassan, what they did to one of the uh, messengers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was sent with a letter. When they killed him, later on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Mu'ta in order to tackle those people. We will come to that war inshallah later on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So here, one man was killed according to rumor and these people did not have weapons. So they were sitting under the tree. The Prophet ﷺ got up and spoke to them. Very powerful speech. And told them, we will pledge. We will pledge to die if we have to. But we are going to revenge and retaliate. We are fighting these people. How many are we? How many are they? Where are we? Where are them? Who has the weapons? And who doesn't have the weapons? But against all odds, subhanallah, the Muslims pledged allegiance with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we will die if it, need, if it need be but we will revenge and retaliate for the death of this one man subhanallah we will die if the need be but we are going to retaliate and we are going to revenge Quraysh news got to Quraysh of this they began shaking as powerful as they were they began shaking why? they loved life they were clinging to dear life and the Muslims, to them, it was a win-win situation. Either they are victorious here or they are martyred and they are victorious in the Akhirah. They don't lose anything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. And then, subhanallah, as this had happened, Quraysh decided to send a man. And his name was Suhail ibn Amr. This man was sent by Quraysh. Go and talk to them. Let's strike a deal. Let's sign a treaty. We don't want to fight. Because this was haram. 
We weren't supposed to fight. In the haram, you're not allowed to fight and kill. No murdering, nothing allowed there. But if someone kills you there, you're allowed to retaliate there. No harm. The Quran speaks about it as well. فَإِن قَاتَلُوكُمْ فَقُتُلُوهُمْ If they kill you within the haram, you're allowed to retaliate as well within the haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So when they sent Suhail ibn Amr, this man came and he spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, okay, what is it that you want? We want to make Umrah. No, we're not going to allow you to make Umrah. Well, we need to now fight. But Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, what happened is, he had then been brought. And when they saw that he was actually alive and he was okay, they were at ease. But this had resulted in this agreement being drawn up. Had it not been for the rumor, the Muslims would not have pledged under the tree. That tree became known later on as Ash-Shajara, the tree. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in the Quran. We will get to those verses a little bit later. So when they pledged under the tree, it was a result of a rumor. Because of that, Quraysh began to tremble. Because of that, they decided to sign a treaty. Had it not been one after the other for all these things to have happened, the treaty was not going to come. Had they not left Medina to Munawwara to come to Mecca, where were they going to sign a treaty? So this was all the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why obey the instruction of Allah. You will see the benefit. Even if you see a little bit of, for example, difficulty in the path of it. You know, you might want to get up for salah. You feel lazy and so on. But if you are to get up, you will find great benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your doors in a huge way. May Allah open our doors. So they began to sign. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was one of the writers. And there were a few scribes. There were witnesses from either side. From the side of the kuffar, two main witnesses. Who were they? This man, Suhail ibn Amr. And the other one who was Mikraz ibn Hafs, whose people were released. They were surrounded. They were actually, for a while, they were more or less taken captive. But the Prophet ﷺ said, release them. We have not come here to fight at all. And another thing is, uh, we, we are now about to sign this treaty with these people. Release them. We don't want to have any form of captives and so on to give them reason to attack us and so on. So the Prophet ﷺ, first point the Muslims wrote, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That was the first point they wrote. This is an agreement between Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Suhail ibn Amr. So meaning Quraysh represented by Suhail ibn Amr. This man Suhail ibn Amr says, hang on, you need to remove that. If you're saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we don't believe in Allah ar Rahman ar Rahim. So remove that, take it out. We don't want it there. And another thing is, you are saying Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't believe that you are Rasulullah. Had we believed you were Rasulullah, the story, the matter would have been over. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, delete this, take it out. This Rasulullah, delete it. So Ali radiallahu anhu says, according to some narrations, he says, how can I delete this? I can't. With my hands, I must re remove this? No, I can't. Now, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw that his companions were not prepared to delete Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from that particular little sheet that they were writing on or whatever it was they were actually writing this agreement on, he told Ali, Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, show me where it is, I will delete it. Why did he say show me where it is? Because he was unlettered. The word we use is not illiterate. Illiterate is actually a derogatory term. Unlettered means he only could not recognize the letters. That's what it means. He couldn't recognize letters, read or write. That's all. But he was the most highly educated from amongst not only mankind at large, but the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So we need to distinguish between illiterate and unlettered. Here, unlettered. When he was shown it's between here and here, he rubbed it off. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what was the remainder of the agreement? You will go back without Umrah this year. You go back to Medina. And you will come back next year. And we will leave Makkah for three days. And you will enter Makkah for three days without any weaponry besides the little sword or perhaps something you may need in order to protect yourself from perhaps a stray animal and so on. You will come to Makkah. We give you three days and then you will go back. That was in the agreement. Another point in the agreement. Whoever comes will be safe from you into Makkah. And whoever goes from here in that on that path of Medina Munawwara shall be safe. They wanted safety, security for their people and for their caravans and so on. 
Another thing, for 10 years, we're not going to fight. We will be at peace. We are signing a ceasefire, basically. That was the point. For how many years? 10 whole years. No more fighting. Not at all. And then what happens? They said something which was highly unfair, but the Muslims agreed. They said, if anyone from amongst us, the people of Makkah, have to come to Medina, you send them back. But if anyone from you come to us, we're not going to send them back. Look at this. It's not fair at all. The Prophet ﷺ said, no problem. Put it. Have it there. Write it as a point. If this is what they want, we will give it to them. Because obviously, who is going to come from Medina to Makkah? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. But it was a difficult point for the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to understand. They were worried about certain people like Abu Jandal and the others who were in Makkah, who were suffering. And at the same time, they were prevented from engaging or from undertaking the hijrah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now is signing a treaty to say that they won't be able to come to Medina Munawwara. Then they, they were told, you may come back the following year. And at the same time, they, they, there was a, one of the clauses saying, nobody break this agreement, not at all. Nobody break the agreement, the war, we are not going to fight with one another, we are not going to assist anyone against one another, and at the same time, any little clan that wants to join in with Quraysh, they may seek alliance with them, and anyone who would like to join with the Muslim forces, they may join them as well. And this was signed, I've just made mention of some of the points there, and it was agreed upon. As they had agreed upon this, you find Abu Jandal, he was a man, radiallahu anhu, who was from amongst the Muslims, who was chained in Mecca. He had come with a few of his shackles or some of those chains that were on him at the time when they had just struck this agreement. And he says, Oh Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have come to join you, I want to come to Medina Munawwara. This is a test. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Oh Abu Jandal, go back, bear patience, Inshallah, very soon there will be victory. Very soon there will be victory. And then what happened is, Khuza'ah, the clan of the man who had come in to talk to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this same Khuza'ah, they decided we want to align ourselves with the Muslims. So they struck a deal with the Muslims to say, now we will be with you under the protection of the Muslimin with specific rules and regulations and some agreement that they had drawn up. But Khuza'ah joined the forces of the Muslimin and at the same time Banu Bakr joined with the Kuffar of Quraysh. So this agreement started working, started bearing fruits already. And thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ got up and he instructed his companions. His companions were in a very difficult position because they had all come enthusiastically going all the way to Mecca. Imagine the journey, we've made mention of it. It used to take them between 8 and 16 days to go to Al Al Mecca to Al-Mukarrama. 8 to 16 days. Today, it doesn't even take us 8 hours to get there. But at that time, imagine, now they are being told, Muhammad ﷺ is telling them, we have to go back, shave your heads, and sacrifice your animals, and let's leave. They were sitting, watching. They couldn't believe what was just said, in the sense that they knew it's from the messenger. But perhaps they were thinking maybe a verse might be revealed, something might happen, because he saw a dream, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he is going into Mecca. So perhaps we will still be going into Mecca. So as they were waiting, the Prophet ﷺ entered his little uh, tent that was put up there for him. Umm Salama radiallahu anha was there and he looks at her and he says, Umm Salama, look at my people. I've just instructed them to do something. They're taking a bit long. That's not like the Sahaba. We know the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, as soon as something was instructed immediately, they did it. So Umm Salama says, oh messenger sallallahu alayhi wa perhaps it is heavy in the sense that you know, they have come with their animals, they have been ready, they are waiting to go in, they were so enthusiastic. Now that this is an instruction, the best way forward is if you come out and you get your hair shaved or you slaughter your animal and get your hair shaved, then they will all follow. So the Prophet ﷺ loved this opinion of Umm Salama and said, yes, that is correct. He emerged and then he had engaged in sacrificing his animal and he called the barber to shave his head off and immediately the Sahaba radiallahu anhum got up without even one word and they all followed suit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
grant us protection. May He make us from those also who can follow the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As they were completed doing this, they then began to proceed towards al Madinatul Munawwara. A few things happened. This was a very blessed journey. The return to Madina Munawwara, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, a surah has been revealed to me that is the best the best surah or should I say in fact the exact wording of it the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says tonight a surah has been revealed to me that is better than anything that the sun has ever risen upon subhanallah which means this is the best news I've ever had what was the news the Muslims were more or less according to what so one who is just looking at what had happened is they more or less suffered a defeat because they went with an intention they had to swallow that and come back and yet verses were revealed the whole of surah al-fatih al-fatih means the victory surah of the victory is revealed when they were not allowed to go into mecca inna Indeed, we have granted you a clear victory. So some of the companions are saying, Afathun who? Is this really a victory? The Prophet ﷺ says, Bala, indeed it is a victory. And it is a victory that Allah has granted us. Some of the companions asked a question, as per the narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, that what is there in it for us, O Messenger? Because obviously the kuffar of Quraysh, they achieved a lot. They actually got us out there. And what is there for us in it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses saying, لِيُدْخِلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتِ In order that the believing males and females, Allah may grant them entry into paradise. That is what is there for you. So this is a victory. What type of a victory? You will achieve paradise. Alhamdulillah. Is there any victory greater than achievement of paradise? The answer is no. This dunya, we are not going to get what we want in the dunya. Nobody has been promised that they will get what they want in the dunya. What happens is, in this dunya we are tested. Some have certain things, some have very few things, some have a little bit more, some have a little bit less. But the ultimate goodness is paradise. So they were told you will be achieving paradise. They were very, very happy at that. And Alhamdulillah, the Muslims began to proceed. As they proceeded, something else happened. A lady by the name of Umm Kulthum binti Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. She was one of those who was stuck in Mecca. She came and she was taking or she was undertaking the hijrah to Medina Munawwara and now there was an agreement to say we will send them back if you look carefully at the agreement it was worded in masculine not in feminine that's one point that some of the ulama have drawn and if you look at the verse of the Quran even if it was not worded in that particular way the Quran says when a Muslim female comes you test her with a few questions, if she passes the test and you know that she is only engaging in the hijrah for the sake of Allah, not in order to achieve something material and not in order to come to relatives and so on, but solely for the pleasure of Allah, it is forbidden to send her back to the mushriks and the kuffar. Not at all. And what you do, if she is a married woman who is married to a mushrik and she has come as a mu'mina, as a believing female to al Madinah al munawwara you test her. If she passes the test, you do not let her go back. But at the same time, whatever the person whom she was married to has spent upon her, you must reimburse the entire amount. And then she will be considered as divorced from that particular man. And after the iddah, she can get married to whomsoever she wishes. This is an instruction of the Qur'an. If you read Surah Al-Fatih, you will find it even Surah Al-Mumtahina. Various other surahs of the Quran have made mention of so many rules and regulations. There is a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, idha jaakum al-mu'minatu muhajiratin famtahinun. O you who believe, when the female muhajirat come to you, test them. What was the test? A few questions to confirm that they are doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is the case, the Quran continues to say, don't send them back. La tarji'uhunna ilal kuffar. 
Don't send them back to the disbelievers. So this was the exception. Now, another man known as Abu Basir or Abu Busayr, Utbah ibn Usayr al-Thaqafi. He was from Thaqif. He was also a Muslim who had accepted Islam. He ran, he ran away. He managed to get out of Mecca to Al-Mukarramah and he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina Munawwara. Quraysh sent two men to get this man. When Quraysh sent two men to get this man, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at him and said, you have to go back. We have an agreement between us and Quraysh. You've got to go back, bear patience, and inshallah we will be having victory very soon. Allah will open the doors very soon. So this man, Utbah ibn Usaid, known as Abu Basir, he was very hurt in the sense that he didn't want to go back. So he went in the company of these two men. When they got to Dil Hulayfa, he attacked them. And one of them was executed because he didn't want to go back and he didn't want to be harmed. He knew if I go back, they're going to punish me, penalize me, perhaps execute me. One of them was executed and the other one ran away. So this Abu Basir comes back to Medina Munawwara. The Prophet ﷺ told him, look, what is it? He said, this is what happened. He said, no, I cannot accept you in Medina. You can go anywhere else, but not in Medina. And this resulted in something great, something very big. They went onto the path of Sham, the, the region not too far from Medina Munawwara, but on the road towards Sham. And what happened? They stayed there. And he invited others who were in a similar position like him, such as Abu Jandal. According to some narrations, Abu Jandal joined him. So they were not in Medina. They were now in a third place. So Quraysh cannot say we need the man because we don't have the man. And he is gone. So they were now based and stationed in a certain place and they used to waylay the caravans of Quraysh. As they came, these people would, would enter and they would attack and so on. So Quraysh became so fed up that in no time they sent to Rasulullah a messenger saying, one clause of this agreement we had struck, we want to delete it. What is the clause? The clause that if anyone from us comes to you, you must send them back. Don't send them back. You rather keep them. Because now they realize these people are going to a third place. They're causing harm to us. Because Ardullah Wasi'a, the land of Allah is so broad. If you are not going to be here or there, you can be in a third place. Subhanallah. May Allah open our doors and grant us understanding. So look at the victory of the Muslims. It already started. They deleted one. And at the same time, Subhanallah, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed a beautiful surah exposing those A'rab that we spoke about at the beginning of this session. Those Bedouin Arabs who had delayed to come because they thought the Muslims are not going to return. So Allah says, سَيَقُولُ لَكَ الْمُخَلَّفُونَ إِذَا طَلَقُتُ سَيَقُولُ لَكَ الْمُخَلَّفُونَ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ شَغَلَتْنَا أَمْوَالُنَا وَأَهْلُونَا فَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَنَا الله أكبر when you go back, those same people who had delayed to respond, they will come to you and say, no, 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 we wanted to join you, but we were busy with our family and our wealth and we had other you know, occupation we were engaged in. So please seek forgiveness for us. Allah says, they are telling you with their tongues what is not in their hearts. Allah says, بَلْ ظَنَنْتُمْ الرَّسُولُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِمْ أَبَدًا you thought that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers were never going to return back to their homes. That is why you didn't join them. They were exposed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed several verses explaining how to treat these people and how to tell them that the next time we go out, you'd better join us. If you don't join us, then we will consider you X, Y, and Z. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection and may he make us from those who understand. Uh, now, there was something that happened as a result of this agreement. The kuffar for the first time witnessed how Muslims were living because now there was peace. No one was worried. As you know, Banu Quraidah, gone. Banu Nadir went before them. Banu Qaynuqa, gone before them. So that problem is solved temporarily because Banu Nadir still had to be sorted out. They had gone, some of them, to Khaybar. And from there, they were the ones responsible for making the alliance that resulted in the battle of the trench. So the Prophet ﷺ had already planned, we're going to go for them. But in the meantime, there's peace between the Arabs. 
And what this resulted in so many of them witnessing how beautiful the lives of the Muslims are, the rules of cleanliness, the rules and of the, the morals and so on, the respect, the etiquettes, the social conduct, the belief in Allah alone, no idols and so on. So it started becoming a da'wah on its own, a call to Islam just by watching. Today, you know, people feel shy. They say, I need to leave my salah, but this is an airport. You know, what should I do now? Okay, if there's no salah facility, what can you do? Wallahi, you don't have an option but to choose a corner where you have to lay down your musalla and you have to leave your salah. There's no option. And if you're thinking for a moment that I am shy of the people who are passing, Wallahi, let me tell you, the bulk of them will probably learn much more than they ever have just by watching you. And they will have it in their hearts, some good form of a, a feeling within their hearts. There will be just a few who might look at us and think that what are these people doing? The rest of them know very well that this is a deen that cannot be competed with. So that is why do not feel for a moment embarrassed about your own faith. Sometimes we as Muslim, and I know it happens to some of the youngsters, you know, you're going somewhere and you're wearing a headgear, for example. Suddenly it goes out. It's in the pocket. Why? Hey, you know what? Brother, don't worry. Your identification, people need to know you're a good man. You have pure Islamic identification. And at the same time, you have character and conduct that far outweighs anything they can come with. Allahu Akbar. Why should we pretend not to be Muslim? Why pretend? Become hypocritical. Don't be shy. Your name is Muhammad. Stop saying Mo. No, say Muhammad. No, no problem. If it is Abdul Aziz, stop saying Duli. Allah protect us. Allah protect us. Wallahi, this is what's happening. Why are we shy of our identity? We need to engage in Salah. We need to remember, say, my name is Abdul Aziz, I'm a Muslim. So what? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. This is how some of them accepted Islam. Just by watching and just by looking. The only thing is, there was no hijrah allowed at that particular time. Which means, the hijrah of the Muslims, the door was open up to the day of Fatih. But at that particular time, before this little part of the treaty was actually deleted, they were unable to come to Medina Munawwara. Once it was deleted, Alhamdulillah, that problem was solved. People started uh, coming to Al Madina Al Munawwara. And thereafter, you find in this particular surah, and as I always say, let us take a moment to pick the Quran up and read the meanings of these verses. If you pick up Surah Al Fatah of the victory and you read the verses, now that you know the story, Wallahi, you will weep when you see what had happened. Let me give you a few verses of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤِيَا بِالْحَقِّ لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنٍ مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُوسَكُمْ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ لَا تَخَافُونَ When they were leaving, they thought to themselves, now you see the dream happened and we are not really from amongst those who were fortunate enough to go in and so on. Verses were revealed. Allah will definitely make true the dream of the messenger that he had seen. And inshallah, you will definitely enter the haram safe and sound. Some of you shaving their hair and others with their hair trimmed quite short and so on. So this was a verse. Allah is promising them, don't worry, it is coming. Subhanallah. So this resulted in them strengthening their iman, mashallah. They became happy. Another verse. Powerful verse. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا Allah has indeed become pleased with those who pledge the allegiance under the tree. Allah has become pleased with them. And Allah looked at their hearts. Allah has seen the condition of their hearts. Allah is pleased with them and is giving them good news of victory to come very, very soon. Subhanallah. Imagine. 1,400 to 1,500 people being told Allah is pleased with you. The verse is revealed. Imagine those people, they are known as Ashabu Shajara. Qad Shahid al-Hudaybiyah. The Prophet ﷺ used to say regarding certain people, 
that this person, how can you speak about him? He was with us in Badr and he was with us in Hudaybiyah. Why Badr? Because we heard the hadith, لَأَلَّ اللَّهَ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرِ فَقَالَ أَعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَإِنِّي قَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ Allah has looked at the hearts of the people of, who took part in the battle of Badr and he said, do as you please, for indeed I have forgiven you. And Hudaybiyah, here it is. Allah says, I am pleased with you. Subhanallah. So this was a gift of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, you are going to be victorious very, very soon. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. As I said, it's very important for us to pick up the pages of the Quran, the Quran and read what it says, understand it. It's beautiful. It is moving. It will move us and strengthen our iman. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Fatih. The surah of the victory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the opportunity to read it and understand it and draw lessons from it and put into practice. Now when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got to Medina Munawwara, there was a lot of peace as we said, mashallah, they could concentrate on something else. Spreading Islam further than where it had got to by that particular time. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided, right, let's bring our scribes. Let's write letters. We want to write letters to all the leaders of the world that we have access to. That time there were no aircraft and so on. They had horsemen who would go, people on camel or horse who would travel. So the Prophet ﷺ, first things, first, he sent message to Heraclius. Who was Heraclius? The Byzantine Empire under the Roman Empire. This man Heraclius was one of their leaders. And the Prophet ﷺ sent to him Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi, radiyallahu anhu, a handsome sahabi. Why do I say that? Do you know that Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam sometimes appeared in the form of this man? Subhanallah. I can give you one quick narration. It's a little bit off, but meaning off our topic, but I need to stop because wallahi, it is softening of the heart. One day a man came. No one knew him from the Sahaba. And he was dressed with white clothing. He was very good looking. And at the same time, his hair was black. He had black hair. And he was not looking as though he had undertaken a journey, which means, where did he come from? No one knows him. And yet, it seems like he did not undertake any journey. He came and he sat in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa just like we would sit when we sit in Ka'dah of Salah. And he put his knees next to the knees of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's asking him questions. Mal Islam, what is Islam? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says Islam, and he mentions the five pillars. So this man says, you are right. So the Sahaba say, this man is asking a question and when the answer comes, he says, you are right. Come on. Imagine someone's asking you, how old are you? You say, I'm 45. He says, yes, you're right. You're right. Well, then why did you ask me if you knew? Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. So he asked another question. Mal Iman. What is Iman? The Prophet sallallahu mentioned the pillars of Iman. He says, you are right. Sahaba say, we were surprised again. Then he says, Mal Ihsan. The Prophet sallallahu answered the question again. What is Ihsan? Then he asked, when is the hour? The Prophet ﷺ responds with the historic response, Mal Mas'ulu Anha Bi A'lama Min as The one who is being asked does not know any more about this question than the one who is asking. What a powerful way of answering, subhanAllah. And then what happens? He asked, okay, so what are the signs of this hour? So the Prophet ﷺ says a few of the signs and so on. Then he, he gets up after he says, you are right, and he walks away. When he walks away, the Prophet ﷺ says, do you know who this was? They say, Allah and his messenger know best. He says, هذا جبريل أتاكم يعلمكم أمر دينكم. This was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion with a Q&A, basically. He was asking and the response. Then he was saying, okay, he asked another question. So when he was asking, the people around were all learning something. Subhanallah. May Allah open our doors. That was Jibreel. So we say, Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi. The reason why we diverted is because Jibreel alayhi salam sometimes came in his form. And this man was sent to Heraclius. When he got to Heraclius, and I'm going to mention this in detail today. And tomorrow, inshallah, we'll see the rest of the letters that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent. And we'll probably go into the battle of Khaybar as well. And what happened? This Heraclius, something very amazing happened. Obviously, under the Roman Empire, the messenger Dihya radiallahu anh, comes to him with this letter. What did the letter say? Simple, straightforward, to the point. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is from Muhammad to Rasul, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to Heraclius. 
And the, the, it says there, Aslim taslam yu'tik Allahu ajraka marrataini fa inta wallayka fa alayka ithma al-arisiyin. A letter very straightforward to the point. Accept the message and you will be saved. And the message obviously, Dihya al-Kalbi radiallahu anhu was there. He, he knew what the message was. And at the same time, he, the letter had in it, if you do not accept the message, and if you do not accept this deen, then you will bear the sin of all your subjects. This man looked at the letter and something struck. So he says, is there anyone in our area here who has come from that land whom perhaps we could talk to? So the people said, yes, there is a group of Qurashis, of Quraysh, who have come to do business. They used to come to Asham anyway to do business. So they have come from amongst them. There, there was Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, at that time he was not yet a Muslim. He was called with his group of people to see Heraclius. And when he stands in front of him, he says, Who from amongst you is the most closest related to this man who's claiming to be a prophet? Abu Sufyan says, it's me. Because obviously he was a Qurashi. The others were not so close to that clan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what happened as a result, he called him forward and he said, come forward. He told his men, stand behind him. We don't want to see the others just now. They are shy. I'm going to ask this man questions. And if he lies, we don't want to see the reaction of those people. So immediately Abu Sufyan knew I need to speak the truth here. So he asked Abu Sufyan, this man who's claiming to be a messenger. What is his lineage? Does he have a good lineage? Abu Sufyan says, yes, he has a good lineage. Obviously, he just said he was a relative. So it has to be a good, good lineage. He says, yes, he has a good lineage. He says thereafter, he says, has anyone before him ever said something similar to what he has said? Abu Sufyan said, no, he's the first one who came with it. Have there been any kings or leaders from his parents or family? No. Thereafter, he says, have you ever considered him a liar in anything? Has he lied? No, he's not a liar. We never knew him as a liar. Then he says, have any of his forefathers uttered words similar to this? The answer is no. Who are the people who follow him? The wealthy or the influential or those who do not have much influence? He said, well, those who don't have much influence are the ones who follow him. Then he says, are the numbers of his followers increasing or decreasing? He says, well, they are increasing. He, then he says, are people who have accepted his message ever reneging, coming back and rejecting the message? He says, not one of them. Then he says, does he ever break his promise and his treaty when he promises? He says, no, never. In fact, right now we are here because of a treaty we have with him. That's what he says. Then he says, have you ever fought him? And if you have, what is the result of the war? He says, well, we have fought him. So one war he wins, one war we win. One war he wins, one war we win. So this man was convinced. He says, wallahi. If what you are telling me is true, then he is the messenger that we are waiting for. But I did not expect him to be from amongst the Arabs. And wallahi, if what you are saying is true, he will very soon rule the piece of land under my feet. This is what he says. Who? From the Roman Empire, Heraclius. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. In fact, he also asked the question, what does he command? What does he instruct? So... Abu Sufyan says, he instructs us, first thing, أن تعبد الله وحده لا شريك له لا تشريك بالله شيئا To worship Allah alone without associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you take a careful look at that answer, the first thing Abu Sufyan is saying, the Prophet was worried about shirk. Nobody must engage in association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So up to this day, the prime message of Islam, worship Allah alone. Do not associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this man says to Abu Sufyan, you see, I asked you about his lineage because the messengers come with a good lineage. I asked you if anyone before him has said anything of this nature because perhaps he would just be following them. I asked you about his forefathers because if his forefathers were leaders or kings, perhaps he just wanted to gain it back. I asked you if anyone, I asked you if anyone called him a liar or if he was a liar. When you said no, I knew that if he does not lie about people, he would never lie about the Almighty. Subhanallah. Simple. 
if a man doesn't lie between one another, why would he lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then I asked you about his followers because all the messengers, the followers, their followers primarily are those who are not that influential. And thereafter, I asked you, do they increase or decrease? Because as the Iman increases, nobody would actually go back. And the, the numbers would never ever decrease. And thereafter, I asked you about whether he breaks promises because a messenger does not break a promise. And I asked you if you fight him and who wins? And all the messengers, they win and they lose. They win and they lose. But final victory is theirs. Do you know what happened? The people around Heraclius began to make a noise to the degree that they had to send Abu Sufyan and them out and they were discussing amongst themselves whatever they discussed. Abu Sufyan later on himself says that I told my people of Quraysh at, at that particular time that you see this Ibn Abi Kabshah, that was the name they used to use for Rasulullah He says, you see, even the Roman king is fearing him. Look at this. Even the Roman king is fearing him. And Abu Sufyan says later on that it was at that point when I felt in my heart the first effect of Islam. See, he didn't accept Islam at that stage, Abu Sufyan. But this man Heraclius, who did not accept Islam, but he had a discussion, he knew this is right. So when Heraclius met his leaders in Hims a little bit later on, he had a meeting with them, all his chiefs. He closed the doors and he told them, look, there is a messenger. He gave them the story. They were so upset. They all rushed to the door. They found it locked. When they got back, he told them, relax, take it easy. I'm not telling it to you because I want to follow him. I am telling it to you to see how seriously you take your faith. So don't worry, we're not going to follow him. Look at this. After knowing what was right and wrong, after asking the questions, he still did not accept. And this is why we say, and I want to end on this note, my beloved brothers and sisters, we know what is right. We know what we have is right. We don't have a doubt. Why is it that we take so long? We take so long to leave that which will earn the wrath of Allah, our bad habits. We take so long to leave them. Why is it that we cannot leave sin for the sake of Allah when what we have, we know it is right. We take so long to respond. Why is it that we feel lazy to obey the instruction of Allah? We couldn't even cover ourselves to save our lives sometimes. May Allah safeguard our women. Sometimes we have a scarf, a piece of cloth, which is so small, which could be the result of our entry into Jannah, or it could result in our entry into Jannah. And perhaps we have just flung it into our wardrobe and we walk out in the total wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We take so long to respond. Come on, shouldn't the hearts of the Muslims soften up? We don't want to be like Heraclius and the others who knew what was right and what was wrong, but they rejected it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the surrendering. Inshallah, we meet tomorrow to continue with this. Until then, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natu.